Hey everybody, today is February 15th, 2022. This is the KCP community meeting. Uh, welcome if this is your first time. And what we're gonna do is I'm going to share my screen momentarily for the meeting agenda. And uh, if somebody wouldn't mind posting the link to the agenda in Google Chat, if it's not already there, then uh, you can add whatever agenda items you might have. There is the agenda coming up. OK, uh, the first item in here is from Paul. Yeah, just real quick general announcement for folks that haven't seen it before. We have been planning prototypes in this project view in GitHub. Uh, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time closing out prototype two. So we've decided to retarget prototype three for March 18th for closing. And based on our lessons from prototype two, we'll begin the uh, P3 demo script a bit earlier. We're gonna try and start that on March 7th. After that, uh, from the end of, of P3 all the way till the end of April is when we'll target uh, prototype four. And that should get us back on the, the monthly cadence. Thank you, Paul. Any questions, comments, complaints, concerns with uh the dates and the changes that we're uh, looking to do. Well, if you do have any um, or want to know more, please feel free to reach out offline or async uh, or later on in the meeting. So next up is Stefan. Yeah, I want to point the eyes on two documents which we are heavily commenting. Um, yeah, maybe just click. Um, the first one we, we have been working for more than a week. Questions around low level API machinery topics and what they mean for transparent multi-cluster. Things like finalizers, syncing of annotations, filtering out some of them, owner refs, and yeah, I see many, many keywords you probably know from API machinery. Um, we have answers for most of them, at least uh, our first attempt. Um, if you have more ideas, we are very open to hear them. And if you have concerns about things we want to do, um, yeah, the same, just comment there. And um, I think we will probably implement those topic by topic uh, in P3 um, and beyond. Um, it's not part of the demos, obviously, but those things must be done to, to make the thing solid and usable for reuse cases, so this is ongoing work. And yeah, comments welcome so much about the first doc. And the second one, um, oh yeah, there's even more content I haven't seen yet. Um, the first topic in here is workspace types. I think we, we talked about that in different uh, occasions already before, that we have to support something like that. Um, FPR, which adds this type, like there's a cluster workspace type. It's also linked in, in the agenda, I think. And it, allow, it allows basically to, to add your own types. The so typical one, or the standard one, is universal. So universal um, workspace, which gives you a cluster um, to work against, basically allows everything. This should be available everywhere. And, um, and if we scroll down, I think we wrote it there. One for, uh, there it is, exactly. In the middle, that's how our cone sketch looks like. Um, when this object is in a, in an org workspace, you will be able to, to create a workspace with this type. And the main thing here is, um, yeah, the field of initializers. So um, this should add the ability that you can hook into workspace creation for whatever use case you have. If you want to bootstrap resources, if you want to bootstrap APIs, CRDs, whatever, um, using such a type, you will be able to do that. And a workspace created will have a new phase called initializing, and we will basically wait in the space until the initializers on the workspace are um, empty, and then the user can actually access the workspace. So initializers, people will remember Clayton added or tried to add that to Kubernetes long, long ago. 
um, in a very generic way um, for all resources. Um, this is very focused here. It's just for workspaces. And for that reason, it's much simpler, not that deep in the API machinery. Um, in the moment you create a workspace, you have to wait anyway until it's scheduled and you can access it. So it's a natural way to, to add initials as I say as well. Um, yeah, the, the blue lines here, um, I think we will talk about in a second. Um, workspace types, so the universal one will always be there, but the type object might be missing. So you can always use universal, even if nobody specified anything. And you will be um, administrator in that, and there's no limitation whatsoever. So that's why it's called universal. And um, the reason for the stock was actually to add those blue lines. So we were thinking, um, how can we handle or how can we define authorization for workspaces in a way that it's extensible um, in different dimensions? Um, at the moment, in the, in the prototype, if you if you run that, we have an ABAC um, set up. Basically, it it checks in the org workspace for general access to a workspace, and then it checks a bootstrap policy, just a basic queue policy in some org workspace, and then it goes to the local workspace. We have that, um, but obviously this is just a, yeah, it's a prototype, nothing more. We need um, quite a bit more. And um, in the middle here of the screen, you see some goals we have in mind. Of course, we want to generalize the hard coder model. That's what I just described, what we have now. This is not enough. Um, item two here, I think, for me personally, this is critical. It's, it's a design principle or goal which we have in KCP, I think, um, which makes KCP better than other systems where you only get namespace access and have very limited permissions. We should try to keep this as a rule that users can be admin, like they can have universal access to workspaces. Everything we build should follow that as a, as a principle. I mean, there, there might be exceptions, um, but everything we build should um, not discourage the use of full permissions and full flexibility for users. For example, this means you should be able to install CDs in your personal workspace. Um, and everything we built here, even if, um, if a workspace serves special APIs like, I don't know, database objects or some pipeline system, what, whatever you can come up with, those should be um, importable, but you still should be able to do the other things like your own CIDs um, with all permissions you need for that. And yeah, the next one, third party API providers, they might have special interests to protect their objects. Um, the, the canonical example is if you offer a CID for, for consumers in, in many workspaces, you don't want that the, the users can right to a status. Status of an object is basically reserved for, for the operator, for the controller of the API. And even if the user, I mean, principle two, if the user is admin, he should still be under the control of what the third party API provider uh, suggests for or enforces, wants to enforce on those APIs. So it it's suggests that um, we need something which gives the third party provider what he has to do, like limiting permissions, but at the same time, allow everything else for that. And so the last one, platform providers also want to restrict possibly, but as I said before, we shouldn't encourage that. So if we do the system correctly, um, the platform provider will probably not restrict default permissions for users. Maybe there are dollar signs behind some features. This could well be, but um, it, should, it shouldn't be a security risk if somebody is admin in his own workspace. All right, so far. Questions around that. The blue lines, I think, Sergius, if he's here, can, he can talk to them in a minute. Yes, precisely. Yeah, if you if you go up again, 
um, like on the very first page to, through the current authorization model. So what we have thought of currently is that the user facing API for um, granting you know, course grained permissions to users for workspaces is that you just simply associate a verb, verb against the workspace slash content sub resource and grant the permission against that verb for that user. And by doing so, um, the hard coded magic happens, right? And what, what that actually means is if you have, for instance, view permission on workspace slash content, what happens under the hood, currently at least, um, you get a role assigned implicitly, and that's pretty much it. And what we do with the current hard coded authorizer is we associate that group with a concrete cluster role, right? So like concretely an example, like some user foo has view permissions on slash workspace slash bath content, right? And by having just this permission expressed via a binding, what currently happens is that you just simply have this group system KCP workspace view associated with the user, right? And from then on, like the canonical uh, Kubernetes authorization subsystems kick in that group is simply bound against the cluster role view, and thus you have access to things like config maps and workspace uh, and you know other resources that are implied by the intrinsic view cluster role inside Kubernetes. Um, obviously, we do this other trick that we explained in the last meetings to fan out to the organizational workspace and to the current workspace in flight to assert if you have um, those permissions. Um, but essentially, what this example is now here also hard coded in the um, current code base has to be generalized, right? So if you scroll down a little bit um, to the universal cluster workspace type, um, yeah, exactly this one, uh, the blue lines think verb group mapping. The basic idea is to make this declarative what we currently have hard coded in code. So what I just described, what we have hard coded in code would be declared in this um, cluster workspace type of name universal um, in, in, in such a manner, right? So you have some policy and that policy would be in that case, a workspace inside this policy workspace in this case called community bootstrap policy, you would have the default role bindings, right? J just what I mentioned above, like the view role binding against the system KCP uh, workspace view group, right? And to a, declare the mapping between the allowed verbs with associated groups, you would have this field, which we didn't know yet how to name. So we called it think verb group mapping. And you would simply have this list of verbs, colon, group declared here. Um, and also if you create workspaces, you want to have certain default verbs um, implicitly permitted to the user, right? So what we also currently have in the work from David, whenever you create a virtual workspace, you automatically get assigned the edit and view verbs such that you automatically also get all the necessary permissions to create resources in it. So this would be like a universal cluster workspace that sort of like catches the 90 percentile of Kubernetes use cases. But when we have an special case like a service provider where you really want to restrict access to certain resources like i don't know a kafka resource and you don't want the user to create conflict maps despite the fact that the user can create workspaces you would create a separate cluster workspace type with different mappings to different policy workspaces and potentially even completely different verbs with different groups where you could sort of like model your permission model in a declarative manner. So that's sort of like the basic idea um, of generalization. Stefan, did I miss Maybe, anything? Yeah, just just one comment. Yeah. Um, the things we wrote down here, um, they look complex maybe. Um, we have a number of dimensions to, to specify and customize things. This does not necessarily mean that all of that gets into the types and especially not in the beginning. So we are trying to, to find dimensions which are consistent if we add them and to find a good model which gives us possibilities for the future. So it doesn't mean that everything here is um, customizable from the beginning. That's not the goal. Maybe um, 
so you said the last one API import export. Do you want to do that? Right. Yeah, exactly. So there was one last bit. Um, and it's a thing that worries me a little bit in terms of complexity. So we may have, you know, have a twist on it. But essentially, the status example that um, Stefan just gave, what you could in addition do, um, you could have like a finer, gra gra finer grained declarative model of associated permissions, not only on the workspace level, in this case, the cluster workspace level, but also on concrete API exports, right? So what you could do is um, you could export an API um, and you could say the user can do anything on it, but modifying the status sub resource. And this sort of like granular configuration uh, would be configured as policy overrides on the API export level exactly to, to catch that use case from the, and, yeah, the initial model. Yeah. It overrides in the sense this is basically also an upper bound. So everything yes. the user does as an admin, so he cannot override that. He cannot mm. give his, uh, himself the permission to update status of a Kafka resource. This yes. is, is it's impossible because this one just overrides everything for this resource. Right. The user is still admin for everything else, but not for this one, not for this object, this resource. Right. So my worry is exactly that. So therefore, we are sort of like asking for feedback is that it's sort of like an overlay mechanism as well, right? So um, at least in Kubernetes, for my taste, everything is pretty obvious. You just get roles, role bindings, and you pretty much have a good view on what um, permission set can be granted, right? Here it's a little bit more implicit. So maybe we can find a better model yet, but at least th this catches all the cases that we discussed so far. Yeah. Questions, comments? I know I'll certainly need some spare time <laughs> to go look through this stuff. Uh, I've been pretty busy. so. Uh, I'm really excited to see what you all have gotten started working on. Um, thanks for sharing. And uh, as always, if, if folks have um, thoughts or questions, please feel free to um, chat with folks in Slack or add comments to the doc. Um, and I think it was posted in uh, the meeting chat. But if you don't have access to these docs, you can join the KCP Dev public Google group and you will get uh, access to all of these. Stefan, you had one other link in here with the, the PR that you're working on. Is it any, is there anything you wanted to talk through right now? Or does yeah, it... I mean, the, the type is what I just talked about. Okay. Um, in the workspace object, there is a type field in the spec, very simple. And in the PR, I also, I changed the authorizer to actually check that the type exists. So um, but this is untested. It's, it's really just uh, written down um, to get those types in. Yeah, if you click there. I'm, I'm trying. It's just being a bit slow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, and there's another thing inside of this PR, which might be interesting. That's what you're seeing here. Um, our ambition is to be pretty quick in making workspaces usable, right, for early adopters. Um, we have concerns that certain things of our original workspace object are not, I mean, they are, they are done, sketched out, somehow implemented par partially, but we know it's not the final thing. And for a reason, it's V1 alpha 1. Um, but as it is, if you, if you, if you get users for, for an API, basically it's set in stone and uh, V1 alpha 1 doesn't matter anymore. So the idea here is something um, David and I were discussing for weeks already, basically to split up our workspace type. Um, behind this is also some motivation which Clayton said many, many times. Everything we build, even a virtual workspace or any other cube-like endpoint, base endpoint, base URL is called a workspace. So we have more workspaces than those which are backed by um, yeah, what we know under slash clusters foo in the API path. So we have virtual workspaces, for example. We might have others. Um, we will see. 
Anyway, so um, those two motivations are behind that. So this PR adds um, um, V1, beta one workspace object. And here, here you see it, very minimal, super minimal. If you move down a bit, spec is empty. Spec will get a type, um, but nothing else. And the status is just a URL and a face. So there is nothing about charts. There is nothing visible about chart movement, not about what else did we have. Um, all, all the fields which are really prototype uh, style that's about everything is left out just url and face and when you go to the virtual workspace um, that david implemented and you create a workspace you use this type if you list, uh, list your your um, the workspaces you have access to you only see those fields so it's a super minimal type we are confident to to offer to users even early stage users in in a few months or i don't know when we will be at this stage. Um, the object behind, like an etcd, it's the same. It's, it's, it's more or less like project and namespace in, in, in OpenShift. Project is more like the user-facing thing. Namespace is a really low-level um, kind. Both share the same key in etcd. One, of the, uh, one is a projection of the other. That's the same principle here. Um, there's another reason we want that, I mean, quality of the types and confidence is one thing. Um, leaking information is another. Uh, I think in a, in a multi-cluster setup of KCP, where we, we basically target service providers um, internally in companies or software service providers, they don't want to leak all the details. Maybe they don't want to leak when they move around data between shards and they don't want to leak the number of shards and all those things. So that's another reason why we don't want to make those things visible to users. And yeah, the PR, the PR does that. Um, I have the server running again. Um, it's not finished. I'm working on that. But I think it, it opens um, the path to the future where we have early adopters. I think this is a very positive step in a good direction. Okay, um, David, Maybe I last, meeting. Very quick, last thing. Um, we will add very soon organizations. Um, organizations will be just another workspace type in the sense we have just seen here. And there will be a root workspace which holds organizations. Those, I mean, those workspaces of the organization type. That's a follow up. So everything here is basically preparation for this step. So also expect that the admin workspace will hopefully soon go away. David, did yes. you um, want to add something? No. Uh, um... I think it's okay. Uh, maybe just one point about the you know inherit from that currently exists in the in the existing workspace. I assume that uh, it was not added there because it would be quite soon replaced by you know API bindings and API imports and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, so obviously we would not not even have to you know create a workspace with the import from yep. um, value as today. All right. Um, thank you, Stefan. Um, so moving on, I created a couple things here. So um, last week, I spent most of the week working on fleshing out the prototype two demo. So I got a whole bunch of commits in here that uh, largely, if you go look at what's in here uh, and you look at the script file for prototype two, uh, I've gone in and tried to um, put together what I think is hopefully a pretty good flow in terms of like clearing the screen so it's not just like one uh, run on of command after command after command. Um, I am on a Mac and there's some issues getting ingress routing through the VM that either Docker or Podman is running on. So I've asked uh, Joachim to try and um, carry the torch with the ingress work. And uh, what I would ask from the community is mainly just take a look at this script file, look at the comments, look at the flow, 
Uh, you can compare it to the Google Doc that I took most of this from. And if there's any changes that you want to make, if there's any additional text that you think would be helpful, uh, let's please get that feedback in because we do want to get this merged and closed out as soon as possible. Uh, I do recognize I need to rebase one thing, which I will do um, today, but uh, this is a request for comments on that. And the other thing I have is our default Kubernetes branch and our fork is still 122. Is it okay to update to 123? I think there's just one PR that is currently outstanding that's targeting 122 and I think it'll get reparented when we change it. So I can go make that change unless there's any disagreements. All right, hearing none. So any other, um, any other topics for today? Okay. Well, this gives you about 30 minutes back. So thanks everybody for uh, the topics today and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.